right, tonight we have three panels. The first panel, I'm gonna get going here, Judge, I'm sorry, a little bit late, uh, is the Honorable Ruben Martino. He's the supervising judge in the Bronx Family Court. He is uh, very experienced in the family court issues we're gonna talk about, but we also are so glad to have him because he is co-chair with Professor Theo Liebman at Hofstra of a special task force work that studies and thinks about and plans for the issues of immigration and family law together. Um, Judge Martino is going to speak for about 40 minutes here, I'm going to guess, 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time for a question and answer. Would you prefer, Your Honor, that they hold the questions, like let you do your remarks first and then ask questions, or do you want to do it interactive? It can be interactive. Interactive. So how often do we get to say, Your Honor, I have a question? All right, come on up. Thank you very much, Judge Martino. Thank you. I want to make sure if I can see this or do I need my reading glasses so everybody stay young so you don't need that. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the advisory council that I'm co-chair of. It's the um, New York State Advisory Council on Immigration Issues in Family Court, and we report to uh, Judge Marks. And um, we have a website. You should take a look at it. We put out a memo on the uh, special immigrant juvenile status issue, also on U visas, and we're working on um, adverse uh, consequences in um, immigration issues. Okay, what I wanna talk about today a little bit is kind of a judge's view on these uh, SIG applications, which usually come about in the context of guardianship cases. So does everybody here know what, what SIG is? Special immigrant juvenile status? For the purposes of my talk, you can just think of it as it's, it's a pathway to a green card. Now, our court, we don't issue green cards. We don't issue passports, although people think that. They come to us for all of these things. Um, but we, su we do see this played out in the uh, family court. So what is the role of family court in a SIG application? Well, we have to make a, a special findings order. And that's really through the context of a motion, but that's our involvement. Once we make that order, then the attorney for the child generally will then do whatever has to be done in the immigration world, which the family court is really not involved in. Now, the SIG applications are usually done in the context of a guardianship case, but it's not limited to a guardianship case. It can be a custody case, neglect, delinquency, pins, adoption, but the most common form or the common vehicle is a guardianship um, application. So what are these special findings that are asked of us to make? They're really five. One, that the child's under 21. Second, that the child's unmarried. Third, that the uh, child is dependent on the family court. Appointment of a guardian or a custodian for a child satisfies that requirement. Fourth, that the child is not able to reunify with one or both parents due to abuse, neglect, abandonment, or a similar basis. The child doesn't have to be neglected or abandoned by both, and oftentimes it'll be one of the parents who's seeking to be the custodian or the guardian, and that's perfectly fine, as long as it's one parent that the, the child cannot reunify with. And lastly, would not be in the best interest of the child to return to the country of origin. So those are the five things that are usually asked of us to find in the context of a SIG application. Let me tell you a little bit about family court. It's a very high volume court. In my county alone, we have about 150,000 pending cases. Each jurist has more or less about 500 um, cases. In most courts, they're divided into specialties, so usually would appear before either a referee or a judge who does custody visitation and orders of protection. Now, jurists can be uncomfortable with these SIG applications and these guardianships. And, and why is that? Because usually, in your typical guardian SIG case, it's one side. So you have the child there, usually with the child's attorney, and you have the proposed guardian. And it's very much against what we're used to as judges, where this person over here 
is telling us that the wall is white. That one over there is telling us that the wall is black. And through the process of evidence, trial, cross-examination, we have to figure out whether it's the wall's white or whether the wall's black. But in these cases, you have one party. You have usually one witness you know, telling us what happened. And we really have no way to, to check that. So a lot of my colleagues are very uncomfortable, saying, well, you know, all these cases, they sound the same. They're all running away from gangs and, and whatever the other uh, facts are. So that's been a, a conversation I've had with a lot of my colleagues. But it's not unusual for us to have one-sided cases. We have inquests on in ca in cases all the time. But just, just to, uh, and I just say that, because if you were ever to do one of these cases, you might come across a judge where there's some sort of resistance, and usually it, it comes from that, uh, whether the person has you know, anti-immigrant feelings or not. I mean, I have no idea, but a lot of it, more, I think, more has to do with not being able to check all these facts that are given about neglect and abuse and things that are going on, usually in, in other countries, that we really have no way of um, checking. All right. So here's practice tip number one, and I'm going to give you a few of these. The more you prepare, you have your paperwork in order, you prep your witnesses, you have supporting documents when available, and you anticipate concerns, the smoother your case will go. Knowing that the judge might not be all that receptive to what you're doing, you may want to think about, how can I best present this? Are there any weaknesses in my presentation? Are there any supporting documents that I might be able to, to give that, that will help bolster my case and make the trier of fact a little bit more comfortable in the position that I have on behalf of my client? Okay, so I told you that in order to get a uh, special um, immigrant um, sage, I, I always get confused. Um, you can do it by way of a different proceeding. The, the most common choice is do you bring a custody case or do you bring a guardianship case? And there are some major differences between the two, although the result is usually the same. Somebody's really in charge of the care of the child. The first is with custody, we only have jurisdiction till the child's 18. Once a child turns 18, you couldn't bring a custody case. And oftentimes, the kids that come before us for such cases, they might be 20, 21. So that's one consideration. With the guardianship case, it's up to 21. But the child, if over 14, must consent. Uh, next, service of process. With the custody case, usually it's personal service or some sort of alternative service under the CPLR. But in the guardianship case, there's a section 17052 of the Surrogate Courts Procedure Act, which actually is what we use for our guardianship cases, that says in a subsection two that no process is needed if, uh, on a parent who has abandoned the child. And sometimes that's, that's key because you may not know where the parent is in whatever country. And if you can show that there's been abandonment, then we are able to forego service, and often people will choose the guardianship route because of that. Also, who initiates these proceedings? For a custody case, it would be initiated by the proposed custodian. In the guardianship case, it can be done by the, propo by the proposed guardian, but also the child could bring the guardianship proceeding. And oftentimes, in the such cases that I've seen, it's been the child with the child's attorney who has initiated the uh, case. So practice tip number two, of course, is think about which proceeding is better for your client in terms of the facts of, of your case. And that will, um, will help. Because I, I've had cases where an attorney brought a custody case and they couldn't serve. And, you know, I mean, I can't really give attorneys advice, but I sort of gave the hint and said, well, you know, if this was a guardianship case, then based on the little bit that you've been telling me, you know, you might be able to convince the court that under, you know, the surrogate court procedure act that we can, we can dispense with service. And that's what the attorney did. They withdrew and then they filed the, um, the guardianship case. All right, so let's assume moving this forward that you decide I'm going with a guardianship case that would be the best avenue for what I'm trying to do. Um, 
So what happens when you, when you file the case initially? First, a summons will be issued. Usually it'll be returnable, at least in my court, in about a month, in about 35 days we would give. Next, there would be a um, state central registry search, which is initiated. And that's actually required by the Surrogate Court Procedure Act, 17062. It doesn't matter the, the section, but, but it is a requirement. And that form has to be filled out. So here's practice tip number three. Assist in, fi in filling out the form, I believe, is called OCFS 3909 as completely and accurately as possible. In the cases that I've had, that's been one of the biggest sources of delay that people kind of fill it out on their own. And they ask like a lot of stuff, like do you have kids? Or all the addresses you've had for the last five years? And a number of other questions. And sometimes people have given incomplete information or have not known how to answer it. And what happens is you come back 35 days later, I see the case for the first time, you know, I'm asking my clerk, do we have the results of the state central registry search? And then it turns out we don't have it. And then I try to do a little more um, investigatory work and I find out that the form wasn't filled out correctly. So now it has to be, be done again. And I usually get that back between like a month and, and two months to get that. And that's especially critical. Um, since yes, of course. I, in, in Bronx, I believe the child has to be listed. But I would get the information concerning the child anyway because the court automatically does a search for me apart from state central registry and I'll see if there are, are hits concerning like orders of protection and, and um, neglect or abuse cases so I get some information. But my understanding is that it is in, in Bronx County on that on that form. No, 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 don't run away, Your uh, Honor. Um, I, so we're gonna do a code word here for those of you doing this CLE online, and it's gonna be repeat, repeat, repeat. We have to repeat the questions for the recording. So the first code word is gonna be the word repeat. So that was Meryl, thank you, Meryl. There was another question, and then we'll bring you back up. Go ahead, go ahead Molly. Yes. Okay, but whatever it is, and whatever county you're in, the, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that that could slow down your case, and what happens, I was going to talk about it later, I'm not sure why, but, but you guys always seem to come to me when the kid's about to turn 10, 21, like in five days. And then all of a sudden, you, you want us to treat it as an emergency, which I understand why. Um, but if you're getting close to that 21 point, this is something that might help because you don't want to add delay when you can avoid it. So you, I, I would urge that you get involved in, in filling that out. All right, the next requirement when you're filing, fingerprinting. There is nothing in the law that says, do you have to have fingerprinting for guardianship cases? But I know in my county, we do it for, for every single case. Not to say that you can't make a request if there's a good reason why we shouldn't do the fingerprinting, but that's another thing. The fingerprinting is a little bit easier. The problem with the fingerprinting is that it's all adults in the household. So it's not just the, the proposed guardian. Whoever else lives in, in that house with the guardian has to be fingerprinted. And these days there's, there's a lot of concern because there, there are many people who don't want to come forward and, and be involved, whether it's a court or anything else, and much less be fingerprinted. So that's something that, that you need to anticipate um, as well. Um, OK. And practice tip number four, make sure that all adults are fingerprinted, because that's another source of delay, that the case is on, I'm ready to go forward. And then I find out, oh, the, you know, the, the two adult brothers or whatever they weren't fingerprinted. So now I have to adjourn um, and wait for the results of that. Okay, so let's say now you've you filed and you, uh, yes? Sorry, just a quick question. Um, do you have any examples of like, reasons that you deem good reasons for delaying the filing of the case? Like, is there any case law that 
you know, a lot of it depends on the, on the judge. But I think for myself, I mean, I might be sensitive to one saying, look, this person is, is not coming and they're scared of immigration and ICE and we've tried everything, judge, everything else is in order, we have a compelling case why this guardian should be appointed, we can present testimony you know, by the guardian or even by the person themselves to say that, that they've never been involved you know, with, with uh, or never been arrested or, or things like that. So you know, that, that might work and that's usually, I think these days, the, um, the reason. Some people have gone through other extremes and said, well, that adult is leaving the house then. They don't want to get fingerprinted, so then we don't have to worry about the fingerprinting. I'm not suggesting that anyone should do that. But you have to make the application. And one of the points I'm going to make, which I guess I'll, I'll bring it up here, which is one of my other practice tips. I don't know what number that is. You need to know the court and the judge who you are appearing before. Because also my little tips and best practices part, that's me. This is how, how I see the work that I do. It's through my eyes, but I don't speak for every judge who even works under me, and I'm a supervising judge, nor can I speak for any other judge um, in, in the state. So it, that's another practice tip. Know your court and, and know your judge. I mean, you could speak to, to fellow advocates. There are a lot of agencies that do this sort of work and say, listen, I'm appearing before judge so-and-so. The other thing one could do is try to approach the court, usually the court attorney, to ask, well, you know, I'm filing a guardianship and, and, and I'm gonna be making a SIG motion. Does this judge have any specific requirements or things that I should be aware of? And I don't think there's anything wrong. We can't really give advice, but we could talk about procedural stuff and things in, in general, and that might be helpful. I saw a hand up this way. Yes. I'll, I'll answer that in a second. So um, I'm sorry, Judge, to interrupt you again. I just wanted to say that up in the Dropbox, what uh, Lonnie Lou is speaking about here is this memo, the Advisory Council, on the ability to waive fingerprints. So it, it is something that you already have. And her question was, some, I just repeating it for the tape, some uh, suggestions or scenarios when arguing to a judge who may not be as familiar with the ability to waive the fingerprints. The reason why it's difficult to get us to waive, this is what we're scared of. The pimp is now gonna be guard, the guardian of this 14-year-old who he's gonna put up for prostitution. I had a colleague who just had a case. They did the fingerprinting. The proposed guardian was not related to the kid, and there was past criminal history promotion of prostitution. That one didn't go through. So sure, if we put that guy on the stand, is he gonna tell the truth and tell us that this is his past? So although you know, I'm saying you can try it, you know, I can't speak for everyone else, and I would be uncomfortable as well. I, um, first, I haven't had applications. I, can't, I don't think anyone has asked me. The only time I think I did it was the kid was about to turn 21 the next day, and the only thing that was missing was the uh, fingerprinting. And because I know that it's not required, then I exempted it because everything else seemed in place and I think it was a relative, so I wasn't really you know, too concerned about human trafficking. But that's the one case that I can think of, but I don't often get that application. Now as a supervisory judge, I'm not doing as many cases as I used to, so I don't know if now with the new climate, um, you know, there, there's more of that. But that's really the concern. That's what you're facing. It's not that judges want to give you a hard time. We want to do the right thing. We don't want to be the judge who just granted custody or guardianship to somebody who's not putting up kids for prostitution and we find out it was us. And then it's like, oh, I should have, I should have ordered the fingerprinting. I would have seen all of this. What a fool, what, what a wrong thing I did. So I think that's more the concern you know, than, than giving people a hard time or requiring something that's not required. So that's, that's sort of what you all are facing um, and that's how we see it from, um, from this side. Um, okay, where were we? All right, so between filing and first court date, first thing, obviously, you have to serve 
the, uh, the summons, and you have to think about how are you going to accomplish that. Are you going to try to have service waived if there's some sort of abandonment? Um, you can try to get a consent or at least an acknowledgement of service. I've seen that, where they've been able to get the parents to, in their own country, to sign a, a consent form or a waiver. Sometimes it's a consent, say they have no objection, and, but sometimes it's just we acknowledge that we received service, and that's perfectly fine. The Surrogate Court Procedure Act, I think, um, provides for, for mailing-type service in certain situations, so you should look at that, but you should think about, I guess my point is not so much to educate you on the, the technicalities of all this stuff, but there are service options, and you should think about that issue as early on as possible, how am I gonna serve the parties that need to be um, served? We, of course, prefer personal service or some sort of acknowledgement of service. Oh, um, those go getting back to the consents and things like that, sometimes we will get documents from another language from another country in a different language, make sure you have translations for us by someone who is, is competent or certified to do translations. That's helpful as well, well because I've had cases where now, I mean, I read Spanish, so I've, I've got a birth certificate in Spanish, and then what I would do is I would have the court interpreter read it into the record. So that's one way that I've gotten around people not having some sort of uh, you know, certified thing. But even that depends. Because if I'm given like a 30-page document and now the interpreter's like, well, that's not really my job to translate, which I don't think it really is, but if it's like a one page or something, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't have any problem. But think about that ahead of time um, as well, that you want to have the translations because that would, that would help us. Um, was, does somebody have? Yes, sir. Yeah. Does the No, I mean, that's a good question. One would think it, it should, but no, it would be in English when it's served. Well, you don't, there's no requirement that I'm aware of that in serving process, one has to translate documents um, in another language. It would really be for the person who gets served to then try to find someone to uh, translate the documents so they can figure out you know, why, they're, why they're being sued. Um, do you know? I don't mean to keep interrupting no, you. No, that's fine. You were fine. so kind to me. Um, just to say that we are in the second hour going to have Megan Stewart and Maureen Chad talking about many of the issues of service process and the details. So I think we can also get there too. So I just wanted to let you know that. Okay. Back to you. Yes, we agree with you, Your Honor. There's nothing in the CPLR that says translation of the doc. Okay. Um, All right, um, prepare your documents. We like to see the birth certificates, of course, with a translation, uh, the affidavits of service, consents. The other thing, the SIG motion, it's a separate motion where you're asking the court to make these special findings. When should you do that? I like, on the first court date, assuming service is done, I have the guardianship petition, I also have the SIG motion. But that's me. Some judges might say, well, that's very presumptuous of you. I didn't grant the guardianship, so a lot of the stuff in your motion where you say the person is dependent on the family court, that's not really true. But you could always word it that it's anticipated that by the time this motion is decided that the uh, guardianship will have been granted, so you can kind of always word it that way. And again, I like that because it's, it's a lot quicker and I can do everything the same day. Some people wait until the guardianship is granted, practitioners that is, and again, you may want to try to find out uh, what a particular judge does, but because we're so busy, at least with me, I, I like it, I have everything there, if everything's in order, I'll have my hearing, and the case will be done. Yes? Question, but in a case where you can't find the, the other parent, and you need an order from the court waiving service, wouldn't that have to come first? Otherwise, you can't serve the motion unless you've got, you, in other words, the motion can't be made unless you can serve it. You can't serve it unless you've got, a, you can't submit it without service unless you've got a waiver. That's Do it all at the same time. Make the motion to waive service, submit that, the motion for the findings, and then you have your guardianship. Because if I grant the motion, then it's irrelevant that you didn't serve yet because I'm dispensing with service, so I can go forward. I don't need to adjourn it any further, right? 
And if I'm dispensing with service, then you don't need to serve them with the. Um, That's right. So That's right. And I've had that done where I've gotten, yeah. The other thing you can do is you can make that application before the return date, right? You can do it by way of order to show cause. So you get a quicker date and say, I'm moving to dispense with service. So it doesn't have to be done at the same time, but it can be done before. But if you just do it by motion, it's really going to be made returnable the return date. So you would do it by order to show cause to get a quicker date seeking to dispense with service. If you're going to try, well, I'm not going to spend too much time with service because that's going to be talked about. Really? Yeah, no, I'm not. You probably know as much as not more than I do. I just fool people. They think I know everything. Uh, where were we? Oh, and that, that goes along with my practice tip number seven right here. If you make all of your motions returnable on the first day, you might be able to finish the case on that day. And... Eight, as we talked about it before, know, know your jurist. What else? Anticipate potential problems and how you handle them, like ACS history and criminal history. If you're aware already, as you're preparing your case, that the family was involved in the neglect and abuse case, that the uh, proposed guardian has issues, then you have to think about it. Should this person? be the guardian, or should I get someone else, or should we get someone else, and how can I explain these things? So if there is criminal history, uh, jumping a turnstile 20 years ago, you know, then you know that's not going to be such a big issue and something that you'll be able to, uh, to explain away, but try to get as much information as, as possible. You may not necessarily see the fingerprinting um, uh, ahead of time. It might be in the file, and you might be able to, uh, to have access to that. Usually I get it on the same day the case is on. I myself don't usually get it ahead of time, but that's something that you may want, want to try to do. Leave anything out. All right, so let's, let's move forward and get to the big day. So you got the paper served, hopefully, and you have everything in order, your motions are made, and now you're appearing before me or some other judge. Uh, what do you do? First thing you think, have to think about is counsel. If, who are you representing? Because you can't represent the proposed guardian and the kid and the parent, right? There are ethical problems with that. If you're representing the guardian, we're going to appoint an attorney for the child. The child has a right to an attorney in these cases, and we will always do that. If you, uh, yes? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. That's okay? I just want to know. So if you're representing the child in uh, proceedings, let's say removal proceedings, you can't represent the parent when it comes to family court? Well, what's, what do you mean by removal? Like an, uh, uh, deportation, like they're, you know, like they're already in removal No. Uh, you, well, yes. yes. Sorry, Your okay. Honor. Um, I actually, with the judge, I think the answer is no. I think it's a risk, but there is an ethics opinion um, in which people who are representing the young person in the immigration court proceeding can separately represent the adult in the family court. Um, of course, if a conflict does arise, then they're going to have to withdraw, and they might have to withdraw from both. So my own view of best practice is that you represent the child consistently all the way through. Um, and then Meryl, I see your hand, but I think, are we gonna talk about this in the second hour a little bit too? So I'm gonna save it, and okay. I'm gonna let you go back. Um, this, this is something that I think what the judge is pointing out is, the norm in family court is understanding today's happy family, maybe tomorrow's unhappy family. That's right. So there isn't joint representation in the family court. All right, so that's one issue, counsel, who do you represent? We're gonna, we'll, always rep, we'll always get a, an attorney for the child if the child is unrepresented. There have, might be conflicts. Yes. When you have multiple children, yes. Sisters, can, you can represent all of them. Okay. Unless you know, there's a conflict. Like we'll have cases, let's say a custody case. One child wants to be with the mother. One child wants to be with the father. We would have two separate attorneys. But if they're, they're united in interest, then there's nothing wrong. And usually the, the attorney for the child will, would represent all of the children unless there's some sort of um, conflict. All right. Uh, jurisdiction, next thing we would be looking at. All the parties served. Did you make a motion to dispense with service? If you make a motion, I require a hearing. 
Some judges might just look at the papers and grant the motion based on that, but I usually want a, a short um, hearing. Here's a, a very important tip from my perspective for whether you're doing the a motion on the, a hearing on the motion or the underlying guardianship. These cases are usually one-sided. You can lead. Not every question has to be open-ended. Of course, the important stuff about the facts, about what happened, the abuse, stuff like that, we don't want to hear the attorney speaking. We want to hear the you know, witness speaking. But preliminary, isn't it true that you came to this country on such and such a date? And isn't it true that you're only, your, your birthday is, you know, you can lead in that, those sort of preliminary matters. And because we're such a busy court, I, I usually appreciate that. And I always find myself giving attorney sins. Counsel, there's no one objecting. You can lead if you'd like. It's okay. And even when I say that, they won't lead. I don't know if they just think it's direct exam. I can't lead. They learned that maybe in, in a fine law school, like New York Law School, and they just won't do it. But um, remember that, that you can do that. Um, okay, the guardianship petition. It will be an inquest, right, if, if we only have one side. Everyone know the legal standard in these guardianship cases? If it's parent versus parent, is best interest. But if it's a non-parent trying to get custody or guardianship, it's extraordinary circumstances. There's a, there's a different standard. But generally, if you're gonna be able to show abandonment, neglect, and abuse, that's gonna be the extraordinary circumstances. But just remember that if, if the proposed guardian or custodian is a non-parent, then it's not just the best interest standard. You, you have to show extraordinary circumstances. And, the, and of course, we're always looking for what's in the child's best interest. Once granted, then we move on to the, to the SIGE motion. We would um, have a hearing on the SIGE motion. As you're conducting the hearing, Keep in mind the special findings that you want us to make. So make sure that everything is covered and you focus on what it is. If it's contrary to the child's best interest to go back to the country of origin, well, make sure you elicit testimony and show me why, why that would be the case. Here's another uh, little practice tip. You can ask us to incorporate the testimony from your hearings into the guardianship hearing. And I usually invite that, and some people will do that. So let's say you had a hearing on abandonment, and you had the kid or whoever it is testify about how they were abandoned. And now we get through that, and now we get to the guardianship. You can say, Your Honor, to, to save time, I would like to incorporate the testimony you already heard from the, the uh, abandonment hearing for service into the guardianship. And at least me, I will grant it because I don't need to hear the same thing two times. And that's a little trick that some people use in order to, to move the, uh, the case along. Make sure you get the uh, order on the findings. My next practice tip, you guys should prepare the order. I don't do the immigration stuff, but because I'm on the committees and I'm invited to stuff like this, I know that you need certain stuff on that order. And also, it's been described to me that it's kind of like a moving target. Like, they're all, it's always changing, like what needs to be on there. I know, like, you, you, you're not supposed to throw, like, federal law in there. They're really looking for kind of, you know, state court findings on abandonment, et cetera. But because I don't necessarily know as much about that stuff as you guys do, don't tell me to prepare the order where I might just write stuff that, that you may not need, so it's better if you all do it. And when you uh, come to court, have a separate, another copy of the order, because it'll be stapled in the motion, and then I'll ask counselor, after it's all finished, I'm gonna grant it, do you have a copy of the order? Oh uh, yeah, judge, it's, it's part of the uh, motion. Well first, the motion's kind of now a court document, and I don't necessarily wanna pull it out and rip it apart, so I generally would ask counsel, do you have a separate copy? And that makes it a lot easier for us and you have um, control over that. Uh, and if you're not sure what you're supposed to put in that order, there are many advocates and many agencies that do this sort of work, so there's no shame in reaching out, and I think everyone in, the, in this, this community is um, you know, very concerned about what's going on and, and willing to help each other out. I've heard that over and over again. 
I think I've ran out of my tips. I want to wish you kind of good luck and thank you. I don't, I don't know how much time is left. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm here. Um, let's stay a few more minutes. First, let's thank sure. the judge. Okay. <clears throat> so we, I think we have 10 minutes. Okay, if, good. if you'll we'll stand for 10 minutes, and maybe I'll just help moderate the questions because I do Absolutely. know how frustrating it is when you're watching the tape and you can't hear it. So over here, if you'll state it, I'll repeat it. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. The Bronx, listen, the Bronx is the place to be. Yeah, Bronx is the place to be. Great question. How do we diplomatically uh, try to elevate concerns we have about judges who may not be as well informed on best practices? Well, I mean, the, the, the first thing is that, you know, as advocates, you guys are in a position to help educate us. And it, it goes along first with trying to know the county and the judge who you're appearing before, because that will help you to prepare. So for example, if, if you have a memo of law on something or some point that, that you think you're gonna get pushback on, then that's a way, because the judge may just not know, you know, I didn't know about this stuff till I started doing it, and I got educated as I went along, said, well, what is this SIG stuff, and what, you know, so you sort of learn about these things, and we usually are, are gonna read the stuff that you present to us to see if it, it makes any sense, because. And I, I truly believe we all want to do the right thing. That's why we do this kind of work. We might disagree on what the right thing is, depending on who one is. But um, so that would be the first thing to say, well, try to be prepared to make your arguments in a respectful way and to be able to back it up with law to say, well, this is, you know, this is what the law says. And respectfully, this is what I'm asking you to do. And of course, you guys have, have a right to appeal. That's always the ultimate. Even as a supervising judge, I, I'm not an appellate court. And I don't have the power to tell any judge who's under me and say, listen, you need to decide this a certain way. I can have a discussion and say, well, listen, did you consider this? Did you look at this statute? Are you aware of these cases? And I would try to point it out. But even as a supervising judge, and even in my super, even the administrative judge doesn't have the power to direct any particular um, judge. We can just speak to them. If there's something, of course, that, that's unethical or totally contrary to law, then that's something we're gonna point out to them and say, look, you can't, you, know, you really can't do that. Um, and there's, there's always, you know, I mean, you can make a complaint. There's, there's, every county has a formal mechanism where you can complain a particular jurist if you're seeing patterns and stuff like that. But if it has to do with substance, the complaint really is not gonna work. And I get complaints all the time, and part of the response is, you know, and this is usually by one of my court attorneys, Judge Martino cannot comment on the, you know, the, the, the merits or the substance of the case that you have a right to appeal is usually through the, uh, through the uh, appellate practice. And, and there have been a lot of uh, appellate cases having to do with SIG cases where judges have been overturned, some have been affirmed, depending on what they've done. Um, so that's, I guess, the best answer I can give on that. And, and I would just supplement, of course, and I think you know this, that um, in our regular liaison meetings throughout the city, we try to gather the patterns. We share them with people like Maureen Chad, who's, who's our, one of our next speakers, who's on the advisory committee. And I think the advisory committee welcomes that kind of feedback about, oh, no, absolutely. about absolutely. practices that seem to be impeding the efficiency of the court or are perhaps being um, imposed by uh, jurists because they're not as familiar with the um, international aspects of the service of process or whatever it is. And so I think um, I, I just am really actually want to compliment you and the Office of Court Administration because you, we have a dialogue in this state that is to be so admired and appreciated. And I hope we can continue it and appreciate you asking that delicate question. I mean, we, the advisory council came out with the advisory memo on SIG, which I think has made a huge difference statewide. I mean, the judges have all been given it, and I know advocates, although it's not, it's not law, um, you know, it's just an advisory opinion, 
but it's something that, that judges have looked at. It's done by us, and we're really kind of part of the court system. Um, so that's been very helpful. And that's one thing, if you haven't seen it, you should look at it, because I know that some advocates will bring it with them and use this, and well, look, it says right here, fingerprinting doesn't have to be, et cetera, et cetera. And um, like I said, it's not law, but it, it's also very helpful that it comes from the, uh, the advisory council. So we have what time, else? I think, for mm -hmm. one or two more questions. Is there someone over here? Yes. So just repeating the question, in the special immigrant juvenile status findings, we have to show the child is dependent on the family court. The judge mentioned that guardianship or custodian uh, exercise of jurisdiction satisfies that. Is it based on statute or case law? I'll let you answer if you want. I think it's really an immigration court question or an immigration agency question, but what do you think? I, I believe it's case law, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Maureen, you want to? Could be. There's a recent case. Did you read the one about the juvenile delinquency, the non secure? Yeah. So that I just saw. That said, it, it, it was not dependency to, have to place a kid in a non secure facility, if I read it correctly. So, Any, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I think many of us have, have tried to read that because the federal statute is trying to cover so many varieties of practice across the United States that, um, in general, it, uh, at least many, some of us believe that it's any time a court is empowered to make a care and custodial determination about a youth, but this recent case uh, does have a, I maybe, the recent case wasn't really only temporary. Okay, it was only about uh, temporary determination. Okay, so um, I think that uh, if you do get pushback, for example, from immigration on that kind of question, it's about educating them about the care and practice in the New York courts, and I think we do have good language in our opinions as well. Okay, one more question for the judge, and then we'll move to our next panel. So, Maureen, you might want to start walking down, because I'm not giving anybody a break. Um, <laughs> in other words, no time between panels. Anyone else? All yes. right. One more. One more. Would the court consider uh, a waiver and consent issues for the parties in another country prior to the actual summon by the court? It depends on, on what it if, says. If they, if they state who is the name of the guardian that they will accept and they will ignore it. So. I have accepted, but not in the context of, of sage and guardianship, but in a regular custody case. But again, that's me. I have accepted um, you know, the notarized statements by one parent stating, I, I consent to the other parent having custody and taking care of the child in the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I've deemed that to really be a, a consent. Um, so it depends, you know, I don't, and because you also have service issues, I think they have to be, be put on notice that the request is being made. But if you can show that there's service and you have a consent, even if it predates, unless that was undone, I, I have in certain cases accepted that as proof that the other parent was consenting. But again, like I said, with all of these things, you're hearing one judge's opinion, and other judges might look at that differently and say, well, no, that's not enough. It predates stuff, but you know, it, it is what it is. Well, I'm going to okay. thank you again.